The following program is sponsored by CBN. Today, Eric Metaxas takes us back to prehistoric times for the story of a caveman. The caveman is not self-conscious. He just does what he has to do. He clubs the animal, he eats it. Draining the swamp. He's our caveman. He's working for us. That's the key. Plus, Charlotte Pence opens up about the second family. Then, a teen walks out of the hospital after breaking his neck. A year ago, I was stuck in a hospital, paralyzed. On today's 700 Club. Well, welcome to the 700 Club. Now might not be the best time to go to Saudi Arabia, but still a delegation of American evangelical leaders felt it was a risk worth taking. So they made their historic visit and met with the Saudi crown prince and other government leaders. As Chris Mitchell reports, the Christian delegation's trip had a long-term purpose in mind, and it was filled with spiritual opportunity. The visit came following a global firestorm over the death of Saudi journalist Jamal Khashoggi, but the planning began a long time ago. The meeting between evangelical leaders from the U.S. and Mohammed bin Salman had been in the works for months, but it came to pass when the delegation made a visit here to the United Arab Emirates. I think there's a lot of people that would say this is the wrong time uh, to go to Saudi Arabia and meet with the leadership there. Uh, I understand that criticism, uh, but I disagree. While they realized the potential for controversy, the group felt the opportunity to help Christians there was more important. Given the fact that we care about the people of Saudi Arabia, uh, Christianity in the Arabian uh, Peninsula, uh, the desire to see more freedom of worship, uh, even Christian churches being allowed to be built. Listen, this all seemed important to us. When people ask, why would you go and why would you meet? I mean, as a, as a Christian called to be a peacemaker, as an advocate for freedom of worship, as an advocate for tolerance and peaceful coexistence, I mean, my answer to that question is, how can I not? They went not with a political agenda, but with a Christian mission. Well, when I think of Saudi Arabia, I think of that verse, we are ambassadors for Christ. Um, that's who we're representing, not the United States of America. We're representing the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, in the Bible, people like Esther, uh, who was in a royal court, Daniel, who approached several kings and played key positions, God used them to speak to people in authority, kings, and the Bible says we're to pray for them. This is the latest in a series of meetings with Sunni Arab leaders. Those leaders including Jordan's King Abdullah, Egyptian President el-Sisi, and the Crown Prince of the UAE. The meetings are part of a long-term agenda. We aren't here for a short-term purpose. We are not here for a photo op. We could care less about that. We're here to build long-term relations and to benefit our brothers and sisters that are here in this region. Rosenberg encouraged Christians to pray. Uh, we're under no illusions about the challenges that have been in Saudi Arabia and remain, but I think it's respectful to go and listen to leaders who have the opportunity to make life better for Christians and actually for Muslims and potentially for Israel as well. I ask people to pray. Pray for the king, pray for the crown prince, pray for the leaders, pray for the people of Saudi Arabia. Chris Mitchell, Abu Dhabi, the United Arab Emirates. Oh, we need to pray for breakthroughs. It's more than just the murder of a journalist uh, in, in Turkey. Uh, the ongoing uh, tragedy in Yemen uh, where over a million people are, are facing starvation, the, um, the blockade of Qatar. I mean, there are a whole host of issues. And then on religious liberty, it's illegal to have a church in Saudi Arabia. It's illegal to have a Bible. If you are mailed Christian literature, uh, you, you go to jail. Uh, these are all very serious things, but uh, can, can, is there hope? Can we pray? Uh, yes, there is. And let's see. Let's hope and pray we can have a breakthrough. In other news, another world leader says he will move his country's embassy to Israel to to Jerusalem. Well, John Jessup has that story from our CBN News Bureau in Washington. John. That's right, Gordon. Brazil's newly elected president, Jair Bolsonaro, repeated that promise Thursday on Twitter, saying, as previously stated during our campaign, we intend to transfer the Brazilian embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. Israel is a sovereign state, and we shall duly respect that. 
Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu praised Bolsonaro's move as a historic, correct and exciting step. Netanyahu also invited him to visit Israel. Well, here at home, polls in the Michigan Senate race showed Republican uh, challenger John James closing the gap on Democratic incumbent Debbie Stabenow. The most recent polling has Stabenow ahead by a clear margin, but Democrats are taking the challenge seriously, with former President Obama stumping for Stabenow just last week. Caitlin Burke brings us this look at a race where Republicans are hoping to take a seat away from the Democrats. The Senate race in Michigan has gotten closer, with underdog Republican candidate John James making a late October surge in the polls. Now he's giving incumbent Senator Debbie Stabenow the political fight of her life. This whole race started on my knees. Uh, this whole thing started uh, with praying for wisdom and asking the Lord to not necessarily make my path easy, but to make it clear, and has absolutely done that. So uh, I, have, I have the faith and believe that uh, I may be in this position for a time such as this. And it's not because I'm anything special, but because uh, God is preparing to do a great work in the state of Michigan. Michigan is a key battleground. President Trump barely won the state in 2016. It was the closest margin of victory of any state in the country. Uh, so although he did win, um, it, it, his victory shows a very closely divided state. Now, as Republicans fight to maintain control of the House and Senate, Political analyst and reporter Robert Yoon sees Michigan as a state to watch because voters here tend to cross party lines for candidates who appeal to them. They've shown that in elections in the past where they uh, elect Republican governors and a Democratic senator or in the case of 2016 vote for a Rep Republican for president. Democrat incumbent Stabenow has represented Michigan in the Senate for 18 years, serving as a commissioner, state representative and U.S. representative along the way. We reached out to the Stabenow campaign with interview requests and received no response. Throughout her campaign, Stabenow has focused on standing up for families, farmers and job creation. She also points to her ability to work across the aisle, even in a divisive political climate. I've worked with Democrats and Republicans my whole life to get things done. John James, meanwhile, has no previous political experience. He's a veteran and a successful Detroit businessman. You have so many people in Washington who are, as far as business is concerned, they're legislating and regulating uh, industries, and they've never run a business before. Uh, I would say that uh, what are their qualifications to impose on, on, on the people? Um, I believe that there's no replacement or substitute for experience. He says his time on the front lines taught him about strong national security. Business experience formed his stance on economic opportunity. And by bringing together soldiers from different backgrounds under his command, he knows a thing or two about unity. During the primaries, President Trump endorsed James when he was trailing, helping him secure the Republican nomination. Now, with only days left until the election, the White House continues to support the political novice from Michigan. Yoon says that while Stabenow initially ignored her Republican rival, she's now running ads about her work with veterans and the military and warning about the close tie between James and President Trump. Not much time remains to see what will make the difference for these candidates on Tuesday. Caitlin Burke, CBN News, Grand Rapids, Michigan. Thanks, Caitlin. Well, more than three weeks after one of the most powerful hurricanes to hit the United States, people in Florida's panhandle are still struggling to pick up the pieces. Operation Blessing has been on the ground from the beginning, helping survivors rebuild their lives. George Thomas brings us that story. After Hurricane Michael completely decimated Mary Everett's home and this neighborhood in Panama City, she, like so many others, is counting her blessings to be alive. When the third strongest hurricane in U.S. recorded history hit, Everett said she knew the Lord was protecting her, even as walls of her home were caving in all around her. I was such at peace. That's probably the most peace I have ever felt in my life. Like I said, I knew I was going to be okay. 40 students from the University of Alabama decided to use their fall break to join Operation Blessing disaster relief teams as they canvassed Everett's neighborhood, removing debris, passing out hot meals and personal hygiene kits. I just want to help, you know, that's why I'm down here. While Meyer's crew worked on removing tree limbs and trying to salvage bits and pieces of Everett's life, 
Stephanie Robinson and members of her local church volunteered to join OB cleanup teams not too far away, going house to house, trying to repair, restore and replace belongings. That included Robinson's own home, which was wrecked in the storm. While she was out ministering with OB to other hurting homeowners, Operation Blessing teams were busy trying to make her home livable. When you don't feel like you can stand up and keep yourself up and they hold your arms up and they bring supplies in, they meet every need they can possibly meet that is within the realm of what they can do. With power still down in many places and supplies low, Operation Blessing partnered with Snyders of Hanover to deliver food and other essential items to victims of Hurricane Michael, giving people hope that even in the hardest times, others will come and help shoulder the burden. George Thomas, CBN News. Thanks, George. And Gordon, no doubt the people trying to rebuild their lives appreciate OB's help and the volunteers. Well, if you're a member of the 700 Club, thank you. You're part of that appreciation because of you we're able to be there. If you want to do a special gift to Operation Blessings Disaster Relief Fund, all you have to do is call the number on the screen, 1-800-700-7000. Say yes, I want to be a part of it. You can also write to us at CBN Center, Virginia Beach, Virginia. Just put Disaster Relief Fund uh, on the memo line of a check, uh, or you can just call or go to CBN.com. Either way, do it now. Be a part of it. 1-800-700-7000. Sure. Well, coming up, the author behind the bi biographies of Dietrich Bonhoeffer and Martin Luther introduces us to a new hero, Donald the Caveman. Kind of a funny thing, I'm very eclectic. I've always been that way. We're living in such divided times, we need to laugh, we need to be able to celebrate the good things that are happening. So that's why I wrote the book. Eric Metaxas introduces us to the cast of characters in his new children's book, Donald Drains the Swamp, when we come back. Well, the writings of best-selling author Eric Metaxas include both funny and serious works for children and adults. His latest book about President Trump embodies all of those qualities. Jennifer Wishon recently met up with him in New York City. We caught up with Eric Metaxas while he was hosting his radio show. It's kind of scary to me, the power that Facebook has. With his new book, Donald Drains the Swamp, proudly displayed beside his microphone. It's a tale about a character called Donald the Caveman, based on a true story. So Eric. Yes. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, Martin Luther. Yeah. Donald the Caveman. Yes. It's quite a progression. Thank you. It's not a progression. It's either a regression or, or nothing at all. I. People, uh, it's kind of a funny thing. I'm very eclectic. I've always been that way. He's not kidding. The conservative Christian has written critically acclaimed biographies, more than 30 children's books, even scripts for the popular cartoon Veggie Tales. And his latest book is a mashup of political humor, serious lessons about liberty, and the good things Metaxas sees happening in America under this president. This uh, presidency, there's something about it. He has a folk hero quality. It's like an American folk hero. Who is this guy? Do you see this as a children's book or do you see it as a, <laughs> you know, it's good for everybody to read? When I wrote this book originally, I was really thinking of a humor book for adults, a humor book about Donald the caveman. He drains the swamp and there's a lot of political humor in here that's specifically for adults. Kids aren't going to get it. But if you do it just right, you do it in a way that doesn't exclude kids. You do it in a way that's sweet and innocent. This book is not nasty, it's not mean, it's meant to be lighthearted and fun. Well, speaking of some of the adult humor in the book, yeah. there's a Georgiosaurus. The Georgiosaurus, that's just a joke. We had no idea that there's a Hungarian billionaire Satan worshiper named George Soros. So make of it what you will. There's also a blue bird that flits through uh, the book. And as you know, birds like to tweet. Uh, so, you know, make of it what you will. Why is it following Donald around? Well, you know, that you can figure that out. <laughs> and I mean, uh, to be fair, there's also a turtle in here who looks a lot like the Senate Majority Leader. Well, you know, to be really fair, uh, and this is not a knock on turtles, but all turtles somehow end up looking like the Senate Majority Leader. It's not their fault, it's not his fault, it's just a quirk of nature. So why did he portray the president as a caveman? 
sometimes we think he's a little bit of a caveman, this president, but he's our caveman. He's working for us. That's the key. He's working for us. Well, I think the power of the Trump presidency is in its simplicity. The fact that he's driven so much by his gut, his yeah, boldness, right. uh, that that's I think is the, portrayed here. But that's exactly right. That's part of the issue of the caveman, right? The caveman is not self-conscious. He just does what he has to do. You know, he clubs the animal, he eats it. Uh, there's something funny about that, that this president is so motivated by his gut, his instincts, that it is almost funny. You don't think of him being, he's the antithesis of Obama. Obama was paralyzed uh, by overthinking things. It was kind of a Hamlet-like paralysis. He was unable to do anything. And you thought, I is he even in the White House? Is daddy home? What is going on? Do we have a president? This president, you sort of feel just the opposite. Metaxas is on a mission to make Americans think. Along with his best-selling books, here in New York City, he hosts a lecture series called Socrates in the City, where he and his guests tackle big issues like God, science and culture. He understands why some voters, particularly Christians, may have to hold their noses when it comes to some of Trump's tactics. Oh, listen, you have to understand, voting for Trump is not necessarily a vote for Trump. It's a vote for the people he's going to affect. God holds us accountable. He doesn't say, well, well, if you don't like this or you don't like the way he combs his hair, don't vote for him. If you don't vote for the person you think is gonna do the best job. They may not be perfect, but the other person's gonna get in. And I, and I think that Christians, sometimes we feel like, well, I'm gonna be really holy and I'm not gonna get my hands dirty. I think God calls us to get our hands dirty. We're living in such divided times, we need to laugh. We need to be able to celebrate the good things that are happening. So that's why I wrote the book. And this isn't Donald the Caveman's only adventure. Look for Donald Builds the Wall, even Donald Goes to Space, coming soon. He hopes this latest book winds up under lots of Christmas trees this year so more Americans better understand the importance of draining the swamp. Jennifer Wishon, CBN News, New York City. Uh, we all look forward to that new book, The Caveman Becomes the Spaceman. <laughs> uh, I do have to state for the record that George Soros does not worship Satan. And in all of our humor about the upcoming election and the current debate, we need to maintain civility. Uh, I, I encourage that. Uh, we seem to have lost it in our culture today. Uh, let's not demonize people. Uh, that, that doesn't do anything for anybody. Well, the book is called Donald Drains the Swamp, and it's available wherever books are sold. Terry? Well, still ahead, a dangerous stunt goes horribly wrong, and a teen is left paralyzed with a broken neck. Alex was just very calm, but you could hear the fear in his voice. Why can't I move? Why can't I move? And he couldn't feel or move anything from his waist down. Watch as he beat the odds by walking out of the hospital when we come back. Alex Kingsbury climbed up a tree and landed in the emergency room. The 14-year-old had a burst fracture in his neck with bone fragments pushing into his spinal cord. And while the doctors gave Alex a 10% chance of walking again, his parents kept praying for a 100% recovery. Kids call it tree parachuting. Most adults would call it foolish. To successfully pull off this risky stunt, one climbs up a tall, bendable tree then slowly descends as the weight forces the top of the tree to bend over. 14-year-old Alex Kingsbury attempted the stunt in 2017. I was off with the little one with Graham. We were just looking at sticks and, and exploring. And just when I looked over to say something to him, I heard it crack. And as soon as it cracked, I knew exactly what happened. And he hit the ground and my heart stopped. And I, I knew something was wrong. Alex fell 20 feet, landing on his head and shoulder. They called 911 immediately. Alex was just very calm, but you could hear the fear in his voice. Why can't I move? Why can't I move? And he couldn't feel or move anything from his waist down. Um, and so he, was, he started to become scared at that point. We just prayed. We laid uh, hands around on him and just said, you know, God, we need help. Calm us, give us the, you know, help us through this, help Alex. Alex was driven to a rescue helicopter that landed in a neighbor's yard. He was flown to Riley Hospital for Children in Indianapolis. Dr. Raskin, who would operate on Alex, 
was on call that afternoon. I was at home at the time that I got called, and I came in to see him immediately. It was obvious that his uh, spine was fractured and was compressing his spinal cord. He needed an emergent surgery. Dr. Dietzen is head of physical therapy at Riley Hospital. Typically, these types of injuries um, do have a low probability of improvement, but the good news when he came to us was that he was an incomplete injury, which at least indicated that there was some chance of the return. The doctors gave Alex a 10% chance of ever walking again. As a dad, you feel like, this is a problem, I'm just gonna fix the problem, but you can't. And so it was a big learning time for me, just in a way, in a new way, to trust the Lord that he has other people that he wants to be involved, and this is ways that they can contribute too, by praying. We prayed and then we, we talked over the concept of, should we, should we post something about this on social media? Because we didn't want to draw attention, but as we talked, we realized we need prayer and we need people, lots of people to pray, so we're gonna post something. Aaron and Mindy spread the word on Facebook and also set up a prayer page for Alex which became our platform to share updates about his story. I think we did that on day two, maybe day three. The surgery to repair Alex's C6 burst fracture took four hours. They said he's paralyzed right now. Um, in some cases, once we do the surgery and relieve the pressure on his spine, he could regain some movement. If he regains or how much, we don't know. We can't say um, the days and weeks ahead will tell kind of what, what he'll recover. So we um, had to wait and pray and hope. But they also said every day they would say, let's just see what Alex can do. So they waited and prayed. After the surgery, they would soon find out what Alex could or could not do. It was about 24 hours after surgery when um, he moved his big toe on his right foot and he was so excited. We were, I mean, we were all excited and um, he just, he had been working so hard. You could see the determination in his face and we were like, what are you doing? He's, I'm trying to move my toes. And I've never seen someone try to move their toes so hard. And he only moved it once, maybe twice, and then it was, he needed to rest and rested for a few hours and woke up in the night and said, I'm gonna move my toe again. Meanwhile, the prayer chain was still going strong. As soon as we saw the rush of Facebook friends who were coming on board and offering prayer and offering support, God was supporting us in ways that we were coming to learn were bigger than what we would even expect. And really, it was exactly what we needed. We posted a question saying, where, where are you guys praying from? Tell us, tell Alex where you're from. And we got comments from Sydney, Australia, Fiji, you know, um, China, we got Japan. I mean, I just, all over the globe. It was so humbling. Day by day, week by week, Alex was able to move more and more. He was in ICU for 10 days. 35 days later, Alex walked out of the hospital on his own. I think it's a miracle because I had less than a 10% chance of walking again, which is really, really big. And also right after surgery, like a day after I was able to move like my big toe. And that might not really seem like that big, but it ups your chances to about like 33%. And so ever since then, I've just been getting better and better. So I think it's just crazy just how well I've been doing, just getting better. So I really think that's a miracle. I remember someone asked me years ago, like, how often do you pray? And I said, just once, but it's all day long. When you're with these kids, that is what you said. These are the great spiritual leaders of today. This is where we invest because this is where God invests. After decompressing spinal cords, we know that some people don't improve to the degree that Alex did. And uh, there's no real explanation for that that I could give you. I think it was definitely miraculous that he improved so dramatically. Um, whether or not it was a miracle, I'll leave that uh, to everyone else to decide. Early on, the doctors didn't know how much he would recover, and neither did we. And they would just continue to say, uh, well, we don't know how much he's gonna recover. Let's just see what Alex can do. Of course, we took that to mean uh, God is in control of this whole situation. And let's see what God's gonna do through Alex's body. And God created his body. He can heal his body if he so chooses. And that's what we were praying for. I'm able to walk and I'm able to run. And 
I recently got cleared for sports again. So, which is, that's really crazy that uh, a year ago that I was stuck in a hospital, uh, paralyzed. All I can tell you is my son didn't walk and now he does. And I watched him learn to walk um, again. And it wasn't an instantaneous thing, but he's walking and he wasn't supposed to walk. And so I, I, I'm a believer. I watched it happen with my eyes. I'm a believer. I saw it happen with my eyes. I'm a believer. That's what Christians are. We're believers. And we believe in a loving God who chooses to heal. Uh, this isn't an on-again, off-again choice. He always chooses to heal. He sent his word to heal our disease. Who is the word? Well, it's Jesus. And by his stripes, we are healed. We were healed. Start thinking about heaven. Is there any anybody there sick? Anybody there paralyzed? No. No, no one in heaven is that way. Well, Jesus asked for us to pray that God's will would be done on earth as it is in heaven. It's up to us to choose that, to say, yes, we're going to believe regardless of the reports from the doctor, regardless of what the machines are saying, we're going to believe that God wants to heal. He's able to heal. We bring his presence to, to, to us here. Miracles will happen. Amazing things will happen because we're believers. And when you get that all set, then when the winds come and the waves come, you're able to stand and say, I still believe. Now, we want to encourage you. We've got some wonderful reports of other people that have been healed. Here's Pamela, Pamela from Maryland. She had ringing in her ears, diagnosed with tendonitis. She'd been suffering for months before she could see her doctor. He told her the next step was to go to an ear specialist. And then, watching the 700 Club, Terry said, you have tendonitis, a very bad case of it. It started out of nowhere. Well, Pamela claimed the word, the ringing stopped immediately, and it's never returned. Amazing. Well, this is an answer to prayer from Deltona, Florida, for 27 years. Paul had been experiencing severe back pain. That changed while watching the 700 Club one day. The hosts were praying. Gordon shared a word of knowledge. Gordon said, God is touching those with pain in the spinal cord. Just receive it. Paul received his healing, and his pain is gone after 27 years. All right, we're going to pray. And as we pray, I just want you to do one thing. I want you to believe. Believe. If two or more agree touching anything, it shall be done by my Father in heaven. These are the words of Jesus. All we have to do is agree, come into an agreement. Is he a loving Heavenly Father? Yes. Does he want to help his children? Yes. Does that include you? Yes. If any are sick, are you part of any? If any are sick, let them call for the elders and the prayer of faith will raise them up. All we have to do is believe. So let's do that. And I believe in faith. Faith is a act. And so act your faith. In an act of faith, lay your hand on that area of the body that needs healing. Terry and I are going to agree. You're going to touch and God's going to do the rest. Mm -hmm. Lord, we just lift the needs of the audience to you right now. And as people are laying hands on that area of the body that needs healing, we come into agreement with them. And by the authority given to us as believers in Jesus Christ, believers that he died on the cross, believers that his blood is divine, and that by his stripes we are healed, believers in his resurrection and believers that that same resurrection power is available to us who believe. So stretch forth your hand, Lord God, to do miracles today, to do wonders on the earth today. And as people are laying hands, we say to it out loud, be healed now. In Jesus' name. Uh, there's someone you're laying your hand on your left knee and you've got, um, uh, the word I'm getting is compression fracture. Um, so God's healing that. 
He knows exactly what all that is. I don't, but he does. You do too. And God's healing and he's restoring that knee right now. In Jesus' name, be healed. Terry? Uh, there's someone else. You have a vascular problem. It's not it's not just one area. It's You just generally have a vascular problem. God is healing that for you right now. There's going to be a freedom of blood flow. You're going to notice it. Mm -hmm. And then someone else, you have an issue with your eyes. It, it's it's odd, like you're whatever, whatever it is, you have trouble getting the right lenses to be able to see clearly. God's correcting that for you right now. You're going to be able to see clearly in yeah. Jesus' name. This goes back to the one with a vascular problem. You've got extreme swelling in your feet and ankles uh, and legs. And the sign for you is all of that's going to go away. Uh, you're feeling a tingling going through your, your feet right now through your legs, and God is healing you. He's restoring circulation. All that fluid is just going to go away right now in Jesus' name. Someone else with problems with your retina and your right eye, and you're seeing flashing, and um, you've got a tear, and God is just healing all of that. He's able to restore vision now in Jesus' name. Someone else, you have a growth behind your right ear, and you're so concerned that it might be cancerous. It's not only not cancerous, but it's just going to begin to disappear in Jesus' name. Lord, we thank you. We thank you for what you've done for us, how you came down from heaven to save us. We don't deserve any of your grace, any of your mercy. We thank you for it, for your love for us. We receive it now in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. If you've been touched by God, share the good report. Let us know. 1-800-700-7000. And I just remind people, we believe in prevailing prayer. That's the prayer that gets an answer, that doesn't give up. And so we're here for you 24 hours a day. If you want prayer, all you have to do is call us. 1-800-700-7000. Terry? Well, still ahead, life lessons from the daughter of the vice president. Charlotte Pence traces her family's journey from Indiana to Capitol Hill. Don't go away. Welcome back to Washington for this CBN News Break. Well, during a time when America is split along political lines, many in the media pin the blame on President Trump. But a new poll from Politico and Morning Consult shows Americans believe the media has been more divisive than the president. 64% say the media has done more to divide the country, while 56% say the president is responsible for dividing America. Well, Operation Blessing is helping protect children from predators in Latin America. Some estimates report that 2 million children suffer sexual exploitation each year in Latin America. Operation Blessing created a program called Yo Digo No, or I Say No, to train children to protect themselves. Instructors use songs, coloring books, puppets, and games to teach kids to say no and report sexual abuse. OB also provides parents with training to help guard their children from predators. Classes currently run in Cuba, Peru, and Honduras. Well, you can find out more about Operation Blessing by visiting ob.org. Gordon and Terry will be back with more Today's 700 Club right after this. Well, ever since she learned how to talk, Charlotte Pence has been a storyteller. Her parents still remember her sitting in the grass outside their house and telling a story to a captive audience of stuffed animals and dolls. And now, nearly 20 years later, she's telling the story of her family and their road to Washington, D.C. Best-selling author and daughter of the Vice President of the United States, Charlotte Pence hasn't lived an ordinary life. She became part of a political family while in elementary school and traveled on the Trump-Pence campaign trail after graduating college. In her book, Where You Go, Life Lessons from My Father, Charlotte explains what it's like being part of the second family and the influence that her relationship with her father has made in her life. Well, Charlotte Pence is here with us now, and we welcome you to the program. Good Thank to have you. you here. Thanks for having me. A new book out, Where You Go. You were seven when you first imagined all of this with your animals and your dolls. Did you ever think that your family's journey would take you where you've gone? Um, no. <laughs> 
honestly. <laughs> um, no, we didn't. And I think, uh, you know, we've just been so blessed to have um, such amazing experiences and to be able to do it together and to be able to write about it was really um, a privilege for me. For sure. and, and writing's been something that you've just enjoyed and been good at and recognized for for years. Your last bestseller received some, some criticism <laughs> and it was about your bunny. What do yes. you think happened with that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, there was a kind of a parody book put out about it um, that also gave money to charity and my mom and I wrote a book um, about my real bunny, um, who kind of, he follows my dad along um, in a typical day with the vice president um, in the book. And so it was a, just a fun project to do together. And so we were, we were surprised by the reaction, but um, you know, I mean, at the end of the day, it's both are giving to charity and that's a good thing. Yeah, it's it, today, you know, politics is kind of a blood sport, if you will. <laughs> Your dad was first elected to Congress when you were seven. Mm -hmm. Did he prepare you in any way for what entering that political arena was going to be like? Yeah, absolutely. Um, one of the things I talk about in the book um, is that my dad, um, he always uh, used to tell us when we would see protesters or when we would see, um, you know, signs outside our house um, uh, when he was getting negative press, uh, he'd always say, you know, that's what freedom looks like. He kind of had this saying he always said. And um, he still does to this day, you know, when he sees protesters at events, he always says, that's what freedom sounds like, that's what freedom looks like. And I think that has to do with, um, you know, the media and just public life. I think that you have to be kind of open to criticism and ready for it. I would appreciate the freedom that is there for all of yes. us. So then your dad was elected governor and he talked to you at that point and said something meaningful about change. Share mm -hmm. that with us. Yeah, yeah. Um, the night my dad was uh, elected um, to be governor of Indiana, um, that was another big time of transition for us. And um, the book really, uh, without knowing it, um, when I was writing it, I was really writing about transition, which I think and I hope everybody can learn something from. Um, our family's been through a lot of different transitions together. And so um, the night he was elected, we were up watching TV and I remember him going to bed and um, he just looked at me and said, everything has changed and nothing has changed. And what he meant by that was, you know, we have this completely new life, you know, this is gonna be, you know, upside down and totally different. Um, but at the same time, we're still a family and our faith in our family is still gonna be the most important thing to us. And one of the things in your family that's always been important is family dinner. Yes. And he, he had some wise counsel about that as well, right? Yes, <laughs> You yes. work all day uh -huh. and then you go home for dinner. <laughs> yeah, I actually got, um, I got him a gift uh, a couple years ago that just was a plaque that had this quote from him on it. Um, that makes its way into the book um, that says, um, you know, do your best and go home for dinner. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of how he lived his life and um, lived his career in politics. Um, he was really home for dinner almost every night. And um, that was that's a lot. Amazing. It was it was amazing. <laughs> yeah. And um, a lot of that reason was because we lived in uh, right outside Washington, D.C. And mm -hmm. so he was kind of able to really be a part of our life growing up. Were those transitions hard for you? Because they happened as you were growing up, you know, living in this place, living in that place, changing, seeing the change in your parents' lives. How, how did you weather all of that well? Yeah, you know, I think that um, our family is just such a close unit. I think that that really helped. Um, we kind of call ourselves a circle, and we say that once you're on the inside of the circle, you're never on the outside. And so um, we just kind of kept that circle very close and very tight during the campaign trail and just kept communication up. Your book is entitled Where You Go, and you start out talking about a, a famous quote from the book of Ruth yes. and tell us a little bit about why that's significant to you. Yeah, um, there were a couple different titles I was kind of playing around with. Um, one of them um, was the chat, one of the chapter titles. And so um, it, they did make their way into the book in some way. But one day it just kind of hit me um, that this verse, Ruth 116, um, just kind of sums up my family and how we live our life. Um, it's when uh, Ruth's mother-in-law is telling Naomi, um, or Naomi is telling Ruth that she should leave her um, after her husband has died. And um, Ruth tells her, I'm not gonna leave you. And she says, where you go, I will go. Where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people and your God will be my God. And I think that's just kind of how our family operates, that we, we go with one another into the adventures, um, even when it's hard and even when it's messy and there's a lot of transition to figure out. A lot of that difficulty and transition and challenge has come from your dad's role, yeah. the role that he's been called to in his life, but the really stable person <laughs> in that whole venture has been your mom. Talk about the influence she's been in your life. 
Oh, yes, absolutely. Um, my mom is, is awesome. Um, and I, I had dedicate a couple chapters to her and just what I've learned from her um, when I was actually on the campaign trail in the summer of 2016. Um, I was kind of her personal assistant. Um, she didn't have one. And so um, I was kind of running her schedule a little bit and helping her out. And I just got to learn so much about leadership from her and how to treat um, your staff kindly and how to treat everybody kindly and to really stand up for people and encourage them to stand up for themselves. And so, yeah, my mom is absolutely um, just a rock in our family. Yeah. You talk about where you go and the family hanging tightly together. Where is home for you with all the transitions <laughs> that you've had? That's a good question. Um, <laughs> where you know, your stuff is, huh? <laughs> yeah, home is where our family is together. And uh, growing up, that was really true. And even when my dad um, was governor, you know, we would spend holidays sometimes um, in different states in different areas. We were in Israel one year, which I talk about in the book. And so, um, you know, we always just kind of realized that our home was where we were with each other. And I think that has to do um, with being physically together, but it also is just a mental state of mind and just keeping talking. With all that your family means to you, another question is, how do you deal with the unfair criticism of people you love so much? Yeah, you know, it's, it's difficult uh, as a daughter. I think when you see um, things that are, you know, said about somebody that you love um, yes, that sure. you don't necessarily, um, you know, aren't true. Um, and so as an American, though, I think, you know, it makes me proud because it means, like I said, that we live in a country where um, people can speak out against their elected leaders. And that's a good thing. And that's not true everywhere in the world. A lot of wisdom. <laughs> the book is called Where You Go, Life Lessons from My Father, written by Charlotte Pence. And I think you'd really enjoy it. It's available in stores nationwide. Thank you for being with us. Great to have you here. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Well, coming up, we're going to take you to a village whose only source of water ran right through a graveyard. See how the people there finally got a clean drink, thanks to viewers just like you, when we return. Nellie is a young girl living in Honduras. One day she became so sick she thought she was going to die. And when her father found out what had made her sick, he and the whole village were terrified. For years, people in this village in Honduras had only one source of water, an underground hose fed by a pool a mile up the road. The pool is filled by water seeping through the soil. Adults and children were getting sick from drinking it. All families suffered from it. We did not know it was bad water. What people didn't realize about the water they were drinking is that it had passed through a cemetery filled with 300 mostly shallow graves. For us, it was a terrible discovery that the drinking water ran across the graves. It really scared us. We were afraid of the deadly sicknesses the family could get. Then Pablo's 10-year-old daughter, Nelly, got ill. My stomach hurt so bad, and I was vomiting too. I thought I was going to die. When Operation Blessing met Pablo, we confirmed by lab tests that there was a lot of bacteria, including E. coli, in the water. So we found a new source of water for the community, far from the cemetery. We ran pipes to a holding tank, and there purified the water. I opened the water faucet and began to drink clean water. I was very happy when I saw the water flow into the glass. We have peace of mind now, because the children in our family are not sick anymore. Recently, we went back to visit Pablo's family, gave them a Bible, and shared the gospel. They prayed to become Christians. When he brought the Bible and prayed with me, I felt something special in my heart. Now I read the Bible with my family every day. Thanks to Operation Blessing for this act of love and for helping my family. Can you see what an opportunity we have to alleviate the suffering of people and at the same time bring them the amazing good news of how much God loves them?
This is one family, one community. If you're a 700 Club member, you're doing this all around the world. We want to say thank you. You are touching and changing lives, and providing clean drinking water is just one of many things you do to reach out and touch people right at their point of need. To join the 700 Club is so simple. It's 65 cents a day, $20 a month, and you do it by calling a toll-free number. It's 1-800-700-7000. Just call and say, I want to join the 700 Club. We welcome you. And I also want to say that when you join, we've got a gift to send to you. This is Miraculous Blessings. It's Pat's latest teaching. I love it, and I think you will, too. Who doesn't want to receive the blessings of God? Well, how do you do that? How do you become blessable? And there are some amazing testimonies in here. So this is our gift to you and our way of saying thank you for touching the need of other people. Call right now, 1-800-700-7000. Well, coming up, we've got your email questions, so don't go away. Those are always fun. <laughs> We want to take some time to answer the email questions that you've sent in. And Gordon, this first one comes from Bessie, who says, I know that when we get to heaven, there will be no more sickness, no more tears. I am, however, worried that we will still have free will with our thoughts that could lead to sin. I know Lucifer sinned, and he took a third of God's angels with him when he was thrown out of heaven. Will sin still be possible? Um, Bessie, the, the short answer is I don't know. No, the long answer is... The book of Revelation gives us some hints about it and, and says that uh, he's going to um, um, be in our midst. And so if God's right there in your midst, if he's going to be the light of the new Jerusalem, uh, then why would you ever even possibly want to get away from that? Why, why would you ever be tempted away? Jeremiah says he's going to write his Torah. He's going to write the law on our hearts. So our heart motivation is always going to be right before him. All that said, Revelation does have this thousand year reign uh, where Jesus is going to reign on the earth. And guess what happens at the end of that thousand years? Uh, mankind revolts again. Uh, so will we still have free will? Yes. Uh, is it possible to sin? Maybe, I, I don't really know. Uh, at the end of that thousand year reign, you, you kind of think um, whoever's going to stick with God from that point forward is going to stick with him. Keep this in mind. Uh, we've got two thirds of the angels who have remained faithful. Uh, so let's be in that two thirds. And the good news is we've got the enemy outnumbered two to one. <laughs> this is Stephen who says, what do you do when it's obvious God is not answering your prayers? I'm not sinning in any area as far as I know. Yet for 11 years, I've been praying for a specific healing. Also, for over 30 years, I've been praying and begging God for a wife, but I've received nothing but rejection from Christian women. I have applied Matthew 6:33 the best I can, but year after year goes by with no changes in these circumstances. Well, Stephen, uh, my heart goes out to you. you. You've obviously been going through it. Uh, I would encourage you to apply the serenity prayer. Uh, it's not in the Bible, but it's a pretty good prayer uh, that you have the serenity to accept the things you can't change, the courage to change the things that you can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Uh, when prayers for healing uh, go unanswered and go unanswered for year after year after year. My advice is stays the same. Keep on praying. Keep on believing. Keep on standing on the word. Confess that. Give thanks to God, not for your disease. Give thanks to God for the healing that he's going to give you. Um, and in terms of a spouse, uh, spend the time now to work on you uh, and say, what do I need to do and how do I need to change? Uh, so that I, I, can, I can be worthy of the bride that God has for me. Uh, do these things and, and realize godliness with contentment is great gain. Okay, this is David who says, my son has three sons. The oldest is already 21 years old. The second is 12 and the third nine. My daughter has four children. For years now, I've been asking my, to them to have my grandchildren baptized, but to no avail. How old should a child be to be baptized? And what should I do to convince my children to baptize my grandchildren? Well, David, I would just leave your children alone. Uh, if they're not convinced of the necessity of it, then don't argue with them. Go straight to the grandkids. 
uh, and show them and, and show them and, and talk to them about baptism, about ex salvation, about accepting Jesus into their hearts. Um, God doesn't have grandchildren, he only has children. And so uh, each one of us has to make an individual de decision for him. And baptism, uh, you know, I was raised Baptist. Baptism to be effective has to come from the heart. You have to say, yes, I want that for me. Here's words from Deuteronomy. All these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you because you obey the voice of the Lord your God.